We might be a small island, but we've got a big history. Everywhere you stand, there are worlds beneath your feet. And so every year, hundreds of archaeologists across Britain go looking for more clues into our story. Who lived here, when and how. So there's a blade wound here, here. So he's being attacked from all angles. Archaeology is a complex jigsaw puzzle, drawing everything together from skeletons to swords, temples to treasure. He's biting his shield. Biting his shield, yeah. From Orkney to Devon, we're joining this year's quest on sea, land and air. We share all of the questions and find some of the answers as we join the teams in the field digging for Britain. Throughout its history, Britain has been divided and enriched by invaders from overseas, and none have gripped our imaginations quite as much as the Vikings. But how much of what we think we know about the Vikings is just a stereotype? Do they really live up to their savage reputation? And how much did they influence and shape British culture? This year's archaeology is enriching and challenging our vision of the Vikings, with digs, artefacts, and messages they left behind. Wow, that is a beautiful object. Like the fortress of a Norwegian Viking chief in Orkney. This cup is absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? The magnificent hoard of silver buried in a time of bloodshed. And the victims of a vicious nationwide massacre. But you're suddenly kind of connecting with this awful moment, which, which is his death. On the Isle of Harris in the Outer Hebrides, archaeologists are just starting to bring evidence of the earliest Vikings to light. A team from the University of Birmingham is digging at a site called Horgobost. The name itself has a Norse origin, a strong hint that the Vikings were here. Just over these dunes is one of this season's targets. Now, archaeologists have been digging here before and they discovered an Iron Age settlement. But there is some archaeological evidence that the Vikings were here too. A couple of burials threatened by erosion seem to have been Norse. And small Norse finds have been discovered as well. But the archaeologists are really hoping that they're going to find evidence of a settlement. And if they do that, it will be the first of its kind on Harris. OK, then, Alice, what we have here is a very interesting Iron Age site with a bit of a mysterious end to it, which we're sort of trying to come to terms with at the moment. Um, if you step this way... Some very striking layers in the ground Absolutely. there. Absolutely. The team is being led by Kevin Coles, and I joined them right at the start of the digging season. The site may hold the key to the first contacts between incoming Vikings and the Gallic people already living here. Will it be a story of destruction? What's slightly more mysterious and slightly more interesting for, for me is this deposit here that's sealing everything else. What is that? I mean, it's a completely different colour as completely well. Completely different colour. It's almost a demolition debris full of very late Iron Age pottery. Right. And lots of charcoal, lots of sort of waste material. Sometimes archaeology works this way. They're finding subtle glimpses within the soil of a time of abandonment. The important thing is we need to find out when this occurred and that's mm. why we're taking samples for carbon dating and see if hopefully see if it can be um, because of the Norse the Norse invasion or when the Vikings came to the islands and whether it sort of clashes with this site being abandoned. Close by a building is emerging that seems to be rectangular in shape 
a style that is Scandinavian and unlike the roundhouses favoured by Iron Age people. So could this be evidence of Vikings displacing the original inhabitants? No, there's a nice corner here. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's lots of stones in this vicinity, which suggests that the, the feature is running under the dunes. Oh, I can see some here. Yeah, so they carry on going backwards, possibly in this Absolutely. direction. There's more here. Yeah. Are you going to extend the trench back? Uh, we will extend the trench back and see if we can get the full plan and see if it is a, a rectangular house, which would be in line with a, with a Norse longhouse. But so far, perhaps the strongest evidence of the meeting of these cultures comes from a scattering of objects found across the site. So we have the things on this side are late Iron Age in date. So you've got a, a storage jar or a, a big cooking pot there made from uh, ceramic. We've also got this very strange, looks like a, a rock. If you feel the coarseness of the outside edge when compared to the flat edge, it's been used and used mm. constantly. Yeah, so what's that been used for? We suspect it's used for working animal hides. And that fits so nicely in your hand, doesn't it? It's you very can... tactile, yeah. So these finds are intriguing because they could be later Iron Age, they could be Norse. Absolutely. You can't really distinguish between them. No, you can't. But from their early investigations comes the first conclusive proof of contact with the Vikings. A tiny scrap of steatite or soapstone, a material often imported from Scandinavia and found in great quantities on Norse sites right across Britain. But what you can say from this fragment of soapstone bowl is that this is typically Viking. Either somebody who was already here learned how to make such a thing from a Viking, or they got it from a Viking, or it belonged to a Viking. Exactly. So the Vikings were here. Yeah. You can see why the Vikings might have felt at home here. This is a landscape that's perfectly suited to their seafaring way of life. You can just imagine their longships coming in and then being pulled up on these flat, wide beaches, ready to start a new life in a land that's completely surrounded by sea. And the arrival of the Vikings would mark the beginning of a new phase in this island's history, and one that would leave a lasting impression. It's a history that is still frustratingly just below the surface on Harris, but I don't have to look far to find more substantial evidence of Norse culture. Just up the road, on the adjoining Isle of Lewis, is perhaps the most famous and iconic Scandinavian treasure ever discovered in Scotland. It was found in the 1800s but dates from the 12th century, a time when Lewis was controlled by the kings of Norway. Still shrouded in mystery, it's a compendium of 93 ivory, chess and gaming pieces, known to us as the Lewis Chessmen. A selection of the chessmen has come back to Lewis some 180 years after they were first thought to have been found. They are such charismatic little figures and I've been fascinated by them since I was a child. My grandparents had a replica chess set. Well now they're on tour following a new piece of research looking into their origins and their story. And it's so lovely to come here to Stornoway to see them close to where they were discovered. The new research places the chessmen firmly at the heart of the once powerful but now forgotten Kingdom of the Isles, a hybrid Norse Gallic state controlled by the kings of Norway. The project has been led by Dr David Caldwell from the National Museum of Scotland. So we've got all the characters you would expect. We've got kings and queens and bishops and knights. And who's this character here? Right, this is a, 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 a warrior or warder, and nowadays he's normally represented by a tower. He's a rook, in other words, yeah. Although he, this particular one, as you can just see there... He's biting his shield. Biting his shield, yeah. This, in fact, I think is, is one of the key bits of evidence that these pieces were made in the Scandinavian world, because that's a reference to a cult in the Scandinavian world, the cult of the berserkers. The berserkers were warriors who got so high 
before going into battle that they, they had to bite their, their shields to hold themselves back. Really? And, uh, I don't think this, this, this uh, chessman is really a berserker, but I think it's the, the carver, in a way, um, just showing his cultural roots or perhaps gently poking fun at some of his contemporaries by, by showing that. The finding of the chessmen is shrouded in mystery. Tradition has it they were lost by a passing merchant, but David thinks it's possible they were owned by an important person living on Lewis. Lewis was the centre, or one of the centres, of a Scandinavian kingdom, the Kingdom of the Isles, which people have now forgotten about. But it's a very important kingdom on a European model, which was here until 1266. This was the year in which the Vikings handed the Hebrides over to Scotland for the sum of 4,000 marks, ending four centuries of Norwegian sovereignty on the islands. But who made these beautiful figures? Detailed study of their faces has revealed that they fall into five different types, which suggests they were made by five different craftsmen. I mean, this face, this yeah. face is beautiful. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favourites. Um, the craftsman who made this um, was, uh, was, was exceptionally good. And ivory is an amazingly tough material to carve. It must have taken days to do this, but just the, the subtlety of, of the expression there, just the, the, the look. And even when you move away from the face and, and you look at the, the knuckles, the detail there, you can almost sense that the, that the hand is actually gripping that sword. Those little hands are absolutely beautiful. And, and the face, the contours of the face, there's even a, a change in contour when we go from the cheek down to the upper lip, that, that crease yeah. between the yeah. nose and the mouth yeah. is shown. These figures may be stylized, but there's every reason to believe they're based on living Scandinavians. The people who carved them were paying attention to authentic details. So the clothes aren't just figments of the imagination of the carver, this is real attire that is being represented. Yes, they clearly have a, have a very good understanding of what they're representing. They understand the, the different layers of vestments that a bishop is wearing, the chasubles, the albs and, and everything else, um, and they, they represent that, that very carefully indeed. These craftsmen probably worked in a major centre in Norway where they could closely observe high-status Scandinavians, where they may even have had bishops or kings as their patrons. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Vikings came to the Western Isles and created a Scandinavian state to rival the kingdoms of England and Scotland, one that we've all but forgotten about. And we have potent Viking legacies in the form of amazing craftwork that reminds us of our shared Scandinavian genes. But what lured the Vikings here in the first place? Back on Harris is another site where the archaeology is reminding us that they first came here to plunder. It's a possible medieval monastery, the ultimate temptation for a seafaring pirate. History tells us that the riches of these Christian monasteries are what drew the Vikings to our shores. This site houses a ruined chapel and there are traces dating all the way back to an Iron Age broch or tower. Professor John Hunter is overseeing the excavations here. Anyway, if we, get, we stand here, we'll just look round here. This is the outer face of the rock. Huge, oh, huge that's stones. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, you can see the collapse has fallen. Massive. And Massively wall, thick wall. The wall's four, four metres thick, roughly. If there was an early monastery here, you're directly on the, the great sea routes that bring Norwegian Vikings all the way down to Ireland, and they would have seen this. It would have been sweets for the taking, really would. 
just outside the boundary of the possible monastery are some graves that might be Norse, and the team has discovered the first fragments of whoever was buried here. But is it a long-dead Viking? Oh, OK, so as well as these bits of bone... Tooth? A tooth, right. yeah. Tell us about that, then. Where's it from? Uh, well, it looks like a lower incisor, I think, and it's very worn, so... All of the enamel on the top has, has been worn down. It's, I mean, it's somebody who's an, he's an adult and he's been wearing that tooth down for many oh, years. Sorry. Yeah. Gosh. Even if these are all that remains of a Viking, does it necessarily prove that he or she lived here? Or might this be the grave of a passing seafarer whose remains were brought to shore before the ship continued on its way? It's very exciting being here with archaeologists who are trying to work out what Harris was to the Vikings. As part of the Hebrides, it's on that sea route between Shetland and Orkney in the north and Ireland, places that were all firmly part of the Viking world. But what about Harris? Was it just a stopping off point? Were the Vikings here only transiently? Or did they actually settle here and put down roots, as the place name seemed to suggest? Well, they're finding what look like Norse buildings. And we have that piece of steatite as well, which suggests that the archaeologists are just on the brink of finding the first hard evidence of Viking settlement here on Harris. In England, there's one city that boasts more evidence of Viking occupation than anywhere else in Britain. York, or Jorvik. The first Viking to take the city was Ivar the Boneless, a Danish Viking leader and reputed berserker. Jorvik became the capital of his new Danish territory in 866 AD. For the next 20 years, the Danes continued with their aggressive expansion until the English king, Alfred the Great, drew up a treaty with the Viking king, Guthrum. The country was sliced in two and the Danes were given their own territory in the north and east, the Danelaw, with York at its heart. Even though they only ruled here for 100 years, York is very much still associated with the Vikings. And an excavation in the 70s here at Coppergate dragged York's Viking past into the present in a very vivid way. Now all of that archaeology is sealed beneath these shops and cafes. But there's a current excavation going on in another part of the city not far from here. And again, we're starting to see the buried history of this city. So I'm going to visit the dig to find out what more we can learn about the Vikings of Jorvik. Archaeologists have been working in an area called Hungate in the centre of the city for four and a half years. It's a huge, multi-layered excavation, but right now, the archaeologists are almost three metres below today's ground level and digging what I'm interested in, the Viking layer. And they're revealing that they were not just about looting and fighting. The Vikings were traders and builders of cities too. Once the Vikings had taken York, they stayed here, bringing up families and blending with the city's previous inhabitants creating a unique culture known as Anglo-Scandinavian. And they remained even after the last Viking king had been expelled, expanding their town and putting up huge permanent buildings. So are you into the final phase, really? Yeah, here? this is the very final part. Peter Connolly is running excavations here for the York Archaeological Trust. Um, it's landscape archaeology, it just happens to be um, in in an urban environment. Yeah. Most of the buildings here sit on an organised grid layout, unexpected evidence that the Vikings had a talent for urban planning. The land here slopes gently down to the river, making it an ideal loading and unloading spot. These buildings were probably storage warehouses. And right in the middle of these structures, the Vikings built something that would have been totally indispensable. 
Now, the stuff that I'm digging through at the moment is effectively uh, human waste, it's poo. Because um, so, what I'm sat in at the moment, it's the uh, remains of uh, a Viking toilet or cesspit. All the bits of animal bone that we're finding in here as well, it's, it's being used as a general rubbish pit as well, although the majority of it is human waste. Um, you are getting other bits and pieces in here as well. But fortunately, it's not just rubbish that's come out of the ground at Hungate. Over the four and a half years that the archaeologists have been working here, they've turned up thousands of artefacts from the Viking period. Most of them are pottery and bone and represent household waste. But there is a handful of intriguing small finds which provide us with additional clues as to what the Vikings were doing in this part of the city. The finds researcher at York Archaeological Trust is Nikki Rogers. So, Nikki, this is a collection of finds that are all from that excavation at Hungate. They are. They're really a fraction of what we've found over the uh, five years that we've been excavating there. We've had over 12,000 individual artefacts. What's this here? Well, actually, this is a jet pendant. Uh, it's quite sweet, I think, because the whole... Well, it's a bit off-centre. I like the shape of it. I mean, that's quite it's a, quite very, a modern-looking well, thing, it is, isn't it? Well, it is, that's a very typical shape from that period, in fact. So where would that have come from, the jet for that, do you think? Probably from Whitby. Right. From the, yes, from the north coast. Yeah. What yeah. about these beads? Are these amber? No, this is all amber here. So where would that have come from, that amber, well, that's, do you think? that's going to have come from the Baltic area. So the Vikings living in Hungate imported high-quality material. Their trade routes stretched hundreds of miles away across the Scandinavian world. But they also used less exotic material to turn out huge numbers of an item that's a little more surprising. Well, these are actually skates. Really? Yes. They are effectively um, very easy to make because the bone is already, you know, that, that size, that shape. Very little has to be done to it to turn so, it. So what is the bone? This is a metapodial, yes, isn't it? Yes, it or is. Something? It's probably a... They're, they're, they're usually horse or cattle metapodials. Right, OK. All that's been done to this one, if you look at it, is... Well, on the bottom, it's been flattened and smoothed, so yeah, that's a very yeah. smooth, flat surface. And that's been deliberately done? That has been deliberately done. Your foot would have sat on here, Yeah. your heel there, your toe there. You weren't able to take your foot off the ice, so you were pulling yourself along with poles. So they're not ice dancing, they're not pirouetting around, no. they're keeping their feet on the ground and they're, and they're using them rather like cross-country skis. That's it. These simple bone objects connect us to customs imported from the frozen Norse homelands. The archaeology of Hungate, the buried evidence of people who lived here in Jorvik a thousand years ago, is not about monumental remains. We're not looking at the elite of society, but we're getting an insight instead into the lives of ordinary people as they started to plan their town. And we see how they adapted their buildings to suit the land and the specific purpose they wanted them for. These people lived in York but they kept a connection with their Scandinavian homeland through the objects that they bought, used and wore. And in a very real way, a thousand years ago, they were laying the foundations of the York that we see today. While in York, the Vikings and Anglo-Saxons learned to get along, throughout the rest of England, their relationship remained uneasy. Although pockets of Danes lived and traded here, they hadn't gained a permanent foothold, and full-scale Danish raids continued along the coast. The English king, Ethelred the Unready, was repeatedly forced to pay them off with huge sums of money, known as Danegeld. And the growing tension between these clashing nations led to a horrific act, the St Bryce's Day Massacre. But the perpetrators of this slaughter were not Vikings, they were Anglo-Saxon. And what's more, the murder was sanctioned by King Ethelred. He decreed that... All the Danes who had sprung up in this island, sprouting like cockle amongst the wheat, were to be destroyed by a most just extermination. <sighs> Sir 
some of the victims of this extermination may now have been discovered by archaeologists in a pit in Oxford. The skeletons of at least 35 people lay in a mass grave where they'd been dumped a thousand years before. It is very rare that archaeologists get the chance to examine evidence from a particular historical event and one that the scholars agree did actually happen. But I'm interested in the analysis of these bones. Do the bones show evidence of violence? Could they indeed represent the victims of this massacre? Osteologist Kerry Fallis has been examining their remains for signs of trauma. This was actually the first skeleton that we found, but it wasn't until we placed his skull back together, because it was in hundreds of fragments, that we actually saw the trauma. There's at oh least ten, 10 blade wounds. So there's a blade wound here, here, there, so that's three. There's a glancing wound here. And what about these little triangular holes? They're puncture wounds made by maybe a spear or something like that. It is awful, isn't it? I mean, you hold these bones, and these are the bones of somebody who died a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. But you're suddenly kind of connecting with this awful moment, which, which is his death. Radiocarbon dating has shown that these people died between 998 and 1019 AD, which means it's possible they were killed on St Bryce's Day, 1002, the day the Anglo-Saxons turned on the Danes. And he also has two puncture wounds to his back. There's one there and one a bit farther down. So these are quite tiny puncture yeah. wounds into the spine. What do you think they could have been caused by? Uh, possibly by a spear, something being thrust rather than thrown. Yeah, so just the tip right. of a spear being pushed in. Yeah. yeah. Again, a young man hacked to death. Horrendous. Most of these men were between 16 and 25 years old when they died. Incredibly, the next skeleton I'm shown is that of a man whose murder was even more vicious than the last. His ear, just behind his ear, has been sheared off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so straight through that mastoid process, that chunk of bone behind the ear. The side of his mandible's been sheared off. So there's evidence of... Blade um, injury here as well. Yeah, there's two definite blade wounds on that side of the jaw. He's got four wounds to his upper neck. So that's as been chopped through, yeah. yeah. And the dens itself. So chopping through just underneath the ear, taking off the angle of the mandible, and then the blade carrying on through and cutting into, into the, the, the vertebrae of the neck. Yeah. Other parts of this man's skeleton show further signs of the frenzied nature of the attack has three punctures to his pelvis. There's two small wounds there, but they've actually come in from the back. You can see oh, these yeah. very square-shaped puncture wounds, which have gone all the way through the bone. So these are the tips of a weapon of some kind, mm -hmm. which are pushing all the way through to here. Yeah. So he was attacked from the back there, so on the left side, somebody stabbed him just above the hip yeah. on the back, and then he's also been speared or stabbed through from the front the as front. well, from about here, mm -hmm. going in and then hitting his, his pelvis as it passes backwards. So he's being attacked from all angles. All angles. And if the multiple stab wounds weren't enough to finish this man off, for good measure, he was set on fire. His forehead has been burnt. Yeah. Which accounts for the missing bone in the middle. And also his hand. Oh, yeah. Has been charred. Is this the only skeleton who has signs of burning? No, quite a few of them have got charring. Yeah. It's mostly to their heads, um, their pelvises and their hands. Kerry, were you shocked when you got these bones cleaned up and into the laboratory at how much violence there was represented on them? Very shocked. I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. It's... And just to have so many different weapons used on one individual. These skeletons bore none of the wounds you'd expect to find on people who tried to defend themselves, so it's likely that they were murdered whilst running away. But were they Vikings? Isotope analysis was not conclusive, but did show that their diet was rich in seafood, suggesting they did at least live a Viking way of life. And then, 
they may have been hunted down and killed for it. So what can we say for certain? We have over 30 skeletons, all of them men, all showing signs of extreme violence. Whilst we can't be sure that they were the victims of the St Bryce's Day Massacre, the types of injury and the date of the skeletons makes it at least possible. These young men were cut down, were hacked to death in a frenzy of violence. And a thousand years on, this mass murder is still shocking. Through trauma analysis, archaeology has allowed us to explore the awful possibility of the Vikings as victims. But a different kind of archaeological discovery has opened a window onto life for a Viking whose luck had run out. Every now and then, metal detectorists turn up interesting objects which have been lost or abandoned or even deliberately buried by their owners and then they've laid hidden in the ground for hundreds of years. But it's extremely unusual to find a collection as diverse and which illustrates as many different aspects of a past society as the hoard I'm about to see now. It's one of the most important Viking finds of the last 150 years, and it's so rich in content that experts are still writing up their findings. It's currently on display at the Yorkshire Museum. So this is it. This is the Vale of York hoard. It was found four years ago by a father and son metal detecting team and it really is an astonishing collection of silver objects with one piece of gold. But what's really amazing is that most of those objects were found inside that cup. It really is spectacular and beautiful, but what I want to know is, can we learn anything of any real archaeological significance from these objects? And given what we know about this period of history in this area, might we be able to get an idea of the person who had this sort of wealth in their possession? The hoard comprises 617 coins and 67 pieces of silver, including items of jewellery, all objects which have a great deal to tell us about the Scandinavian world at the time of their burial. This cup is absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Um... I think probably the finest thing in the hoard, all on its own. It's, um, it's gilt silver cup, so it's silver and it's been gilded with gold. It wow. was also um, decorated with niello, which is a kind of alloy that's black. So when yeah. this was first made, it would have been, if you think of a wasp, a kind of quite gaudy yellow and black yeah, contrast. Yeah. So the detail would have showed up amazingly well. Would you like to hold it? I'd love to hold um, it. If you sit it in your hands, it kind of gives you a, a real good impression of what this might have been used for when it was um, originally made. It feels like a cup which wants to be passed on to somebody else. Yeah. What do you think it was used for? Given the kind of the way that you hold it in both hands, the fact that it's been gilded and it may have had a lid, we think that it could be an ecclesiastical vessel, mm. something that was mm. used in a monastery. So it's possible that this cup, which experts believe came from the Frankish Empire, fell into Viking hands as loot or in payment of tribute. It was made in the mid-9th century, predating the rest of the objects in this collection but it presumably had a lot of special significance and meaning because it lasted another 100 years, so I presume it was passed down through the family and then came to, you know, hold the contents of this hoard. This object gives us a rare insight into the mindset of a Viking. As an heirloom, it connects him back to his adventuring ancestors and their ill-gotten gains. But not all of the items in this hoard had sentimental value. So what about these objects that were inside it then? Are, they, are these pieces of jewellery typically Viking in nature? They are, yes. This is by far the most spectacular. That's the gold, that's the only gold piece, isn't this it? This is the only gold piece in the hoard. Um, and if you'd like, like to hold it. Um, Gosh, that's heavy. It is, it's quite a chunky thing. This single piece is a marker of extreme wealth. Finding gold in Viking hoards is exceptionally rare. Only someone of the highest social standing would have had access to it. And there are some complete items of jewellery, but then there seem to be a lot of 
pieces. This bit in particular, I mean, that just looks like a brooch or something it that's does. been cut in half. And this is very typical of the way the Vikings did things. They, they had a lot of what we call hack silver. The Viking economy was based on the barter and exchange of silver. It was highly prized by the Vikings and valued by its weight and purity. Before being chopped up and used as currency, silver could be worn and transported as jewellery. This is what we call a penannular brooch. If you think of this as the terminal at one end, yeah. it would um, thin out, come in a big spiral, and then fatten out again at the other end. Right. And you would have a huge pin through the middle, yeah. and that would sit on your, on your cloak to keep your cloak together. And this is a particularly beautiful example, I think. It's got these lovely little roundels, and it's kind of this really delicate interlace pattern. Yeah, and yeah. actually it's made of little, looks like little beasts, yes. which are kind of chasing their tails Absolutely. around. Very yeah. popular in kind of Viking iconography, these little beasties. The Vikings travelled thousands of miles across vast sweeping trade routes to get their silver. And some pieces within this hoard connect the Vikings here in Britain with trading centres as far away as the Islamic world. Well, that looks like Arabic script on there. It does. This is called a dirham, and it's Islamic coin. It really is. It is, and it comes from Afghanistan. Wow. So this is evidence of, of Vikings trading all the way over to the Middle East? Absolutely, yeah. One other coin here sheds light on the moment this hoard was buried. It's a coin of the English king Athelstan, minted in 927 AD, just after he captured York from the Vikings. And judging by the lack of wear on its surface, it was placed in the ground almost immediately. And if you look very closely, you'll be able to see um, that this coin actually has the words Rex To Brie. So R E X T O B R I E. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can uh, see that. That basically means King of All Britain. So this coin proclaims Athelstan as the King of All Britain. Mm. So he used this coin to say that he'd got rid of the Vikings and he'd unified the country and, and made it into one kingdom. But although the English king stamped his identity on his coins, the name of the person who owned these riches is lost to us. All we have are the clues passed down by his cherished possessions. This hoard of beautiful objects raises the tantalising possibility that what we're looking at is the treasure, the life savings of a man whose days amongst the ruling classes in northern England are numbered and the hoard dates from precisely the time when there's this changeover of power between the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons. So are we looking at a Viking running away and burying his wealth for safety? All that we can be sure about is that he never returned to dig it up. Govan in Glasgow might seem like an unlikely place to come looking for Viking archaeology, but I'm here to see what is perhaps the most extensive collection of Norse artefacts from any Viking site anywhere in rural Britain. Now, these objects are not treasure. They are domestic items, things that Viking men and women would have used every day of their lives. And they're also at the beginning of their story because they've been excavated, but the examination, the interpretation of them is very much still a work in progress. So what I want to find out is the potential of this collection for helping us understand Viking everyday life. The actual material is fine, but as you see from the package... Beverly Ballin-Smith has a huge archaeological task ahead of her, the processing and recording of all the small finds from a site called the Udall in North Uist, the largest Norse settlement ever to have been excavated in the Western Isles. It was a monumental project which involved a dedicated group of volunteers who returned to dig again and again over a 30-year period, starting in 1963. But the significance of the site is still only partially understood. I don't think I have ever seen so many bone needles, and I imagine we're just starting. So, you wanted to have a look at... That little poppy one. Yeah, sure. Can we take it out? Yeah. Not too. Oh, look at that. 
That's really lovely. What, what are these made of? I think that's a, a bird bone. It's pretty, isn't it? It's really lovely, yeah. There are hundreds of decorated bone pins here, perhaps a reflection of their value in everyday life as something to fix a Viking's hair in place or to fasten his cloak. That's fantastic. In a sense, all these are lost objects. Yes, things that have just dropped off people. Dropped off people and not... And they go, where did that go? Problem. And they've trod it into the mud and then archaeologists find it centuries later. Wow. It's not unusual to find combs in a Viking settlement. They're commonplace personal objects. What's surprising about this collection, though, is the sheer number of them found on one site. Oh, that's fantastic. It's got a little animal on it. A little horse's head, I think. And I love these roundels, which are obviously kind of drilled into the, the mm. bone. I think you look at things like this and you have this immediate contact with somebody who lived centuries ago and this was their comb. And you also know that you have the same kind of sensibilities that, you know, I quite like to have things that are that are nice. I like to have objects which, which aren't just functional, but yes, actually which are well, quite I, attractive I, as well. Yes. The massive task of excavating this site and all the finds buried there was effectively the life's work of historian and archaeologist Ian Crawford. But unable to continue with his task due to ill health, it's now fallen to Beverly. But he ended up amassing a huge collection of finds that you're still looking through now. So mm -hmm. he obviously, he obviously became. Um, what happened? Did he become overwhelmed with the amount he was finding? I been there myself. When you you, you work on a massive site with complicated stratigraphy. So he, he carried on digging. He produced interim reports uh, for every year that he dug. But then there's the next stage of actually writing up and getting mm. the information out to the public. And I think he was simply overwhelmed. Even since my visit, fresh research has suggested the volume of beautiful combs may be proof of a Viking comb-making industry here. It reinforces just how important the research into the Udal will be in years to come. It's great to see just a small part of this massive collection of everyday objects. They seem mundane in some ways, but they also show that just like us, the Vikings like to have nice things. And it's fantastic that this collection is being revisited. Archaeologically speaking, there's still an enormous amount to be learned about this site and all the artefacts it contained. And there must be people on North Uist who remember digging at that site in the dunes. And I imagine it's important to them to know that the last chapters in the story of Udall are finally being written. Off the northeastern shore of Scotland lie the islands of Orkney, colonised by the Vikings in the 9th century. Sailing from their Norwegian homelands, it would have taken the Norse longships about a day to get here. And when they settled for good, the islands became the centre of Norse power in Scotland right up until 1469, the last bastion of Scandinavian authority in Britain. Today, these islands are home to a classic Norse archaeological find and also to new excavations that are offering tantalising glimpses of the Vikings in Scotland. My first destination is the dig currently taking place in the east of Orkney's mainland, near its ancient capital, Kirkwall. It sits on top of a 30-metre-high stack of sheer rock, the Broch of Deerness, which even today is challenging to access. This is such a wild place. There's nothing here but cliffs, sea and birds. And I'm walking up this path that I can't imagine was here a thousand years ago. So I do wonder how people got across from the land there to the Broch. This is such an exposed place. It's a lovely day today, but imagine this on a rainy, windswept day. The Broch is totally exposed to the legendary Orcadian winds. What an extreme place to choose as your home. 
Whether coming from the mainland or from ships secured in a nearby bay, getting here can't have been straightforward. The old path up the broch has disappeared into the sea. So we're now coming up through the original That's entrance right. to the site. Exactly. Can we go and have a look at yeah, of course we can. some of the archaeology that you're exploring? There was once a settlement of around 30 Viking houses up here, and Dr James Barrett and his team are excavating one of them this season. So would this have been the original doorway? This is the original doorway of the phase that we're excavating right now. So there was a settlement here before the Vikings came, and the ground level at that point was, was at the top of that layer. Mm. And then the Viking Age houses were literally dug into the ground right. and lined with stone walls, what you see here. And then above that, at ground level, the rest of the house would have been built in turf and timber. It's likely that the Vikings dug their homes so deep into the ground to withstand the extreme winds that often blow here. And evidence of life inside one of those homes came to light during my visit. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Right, so we're just going to come in here and That's do it. That's just bit. beautiful. It's moments like these that make archaeology so rewarding, discovering an unexpected find, a forgotten part of somebody's life. If you start cleaning off most of this loose around it, it's fantastic. fantastic. This is just brilliant. This is a Viking gaming board that was thrown away, that was thrown into this rubbish pit, this midden, that we've just found in the corner of the trench. And it's wonderful to hold something that was obviously a very personal object to somebody something that they would have enjoyed using a thousand years ago. It looks like a board for playing the popular Viking game, a Nefertafel. It's something that might have kept people occupied in place of looking after crops or farming animals, a task that would have been impossible up here. So their food must have been brought in from other farms or settlements nearby and only someone of the higher status could have demanded this of their neighbours, perhaps a Viking chief and his retinue. But it does beg the question, why live in such a difficult spot? The way it works is what you see. It's a site that is all about seeing and being seen. And when people ask me why were they here, when I want to give a glib answer, it's to make a point. It gives you an extraordinary control of the maritime vantage. And in addition to that, you will be seen. So if you imagine a large hall here, then if you're coming into the archipelago, you immediately know who you have to go and talk to. You, you, you know who's boss. I am quite taken by this ancient clifftop settlement. It seems such an extraordinary place to live, so wild and windy with these crashing waves all around. The men and women who lived up here must have been very isolated in some ways. But on the other hand, they can't have survived here on their own. They depended on support from people living on mainland Orkney. But who were they? One of the reasons the Vikings seem so mysterious is that they left few written records in Britain. But it's wrong to think they didn't write. They used runes. And last year, James found a tiny bronze strip with a mysterious message etched into its surface. Professor John Hines examined it to see if he could make some sense of it. It takes quite a while getting used to it, but once you get your eye in to these things, you start seeing certain letters that we're familiar with. So if you look on it um, here, we've got See that letter like that? That's fairly clear. Then there's a very clearly what we would call an I, I, mm. and another K, and we've got an U at the end of that. Some letters in the Scandinavian runic alphabet resemble our own, and others are more cryptic. To make it even more difficult, they changed over time, and experts continue to discover new letters and symbols. Unfortunately, going across all of the bits that I can read, I just cannot put enough together to form a 
coherent words and coherent strings of words. Interestingly, practically every mark that we've got on that we can identify as being the sort of things they were using as runes. Mm. They've abbreviated what they're writing rather like the people who are younger than me do when they send text messages and well, I try yeah. and work out uh, what, they're actu what they're actually saying there. It's frustrating to be so close and yet so far away from knowing what's been written down by this Viking living on the Brook of DNS. A message from Scandinavian Orkney that we'll probably never decipher. The Norse archaeology I've seen in Orkney has shown me some of the purest evidence of that culture. Because when the Vikings came here, they transplanted their entire way of life from Norway. And this year's research has unearthed unexpected evidence of this Viking lifestyle, of how they settled and shaped our landscape, as well as raiding here. Evidence like the ivory chessmen, carved in a Norwegian workshop, tangible proof of a wealthy, forgotten kingdom. The buried life savings of a powerful Viking whose wealth connects us to vast trading empires. and the horrific St Bryce's Day massacre, when men may have been killed just for being Scandinavian. Through its invaders, Britain became firmly connected with the continent and beyond. And archaeology helps us understand how these outsiders came and enriched our culture and ended up becoming British. And so the digging continues.